Okay, good morning. Happy Monday. Happy to see you. I review with you the topic of this week. And I will then not do what you see on the screen, actually. I will finish the examination of the main ideas in the social history of the media, the second textbook. And I'll do the history of Wikipedia, the introduction, and say a few things about the first reading about Wikipedia later at a later time. So that would be Monday, but on Wednesday we will talk about Wikipedia, and Wikipedia will be the app, the platform of reference for us during the next three weeks. We will look at some of the technical details, even though you will not have to be proficient in the coding language of MediaShare, which is similar to DocuWiki in many ways. It's just for you to know how it works. Unless you want to make uh, the focus of your project creating a new page in Wikipedia, which is not easy. I mean, it's easy to code a new page. It's not easy to have a new page approved for inclusion at this point, right? It's hard to find an acceptable topic for a new page, especially if you are not already active in some way in Wikipedia and you come out with a new page and you have no history. The, the editors might shut it down, the community itself. On Friday, we will also have a discussion and some hands-on activity on the use of Wikipedia. Keep in mind that from this moment on, your assignments are just readings because you're supposed to be working on your final project. And don't wait until the very last moment because you'll need time. You'll need to give proper consideration to your choice of an app for the project. What kind of content? And once you've decided what kind of content, you need to gather that content. You need to distribute the content across different pages in a way that makes sense. You need to find a design, a style, for the presentation of the pages. You need to plan for the inclusion of advanced features in your project that would make sense in the context of the functionality of your project and the knowledge-related goals of your project. Also. The sooner you start working on your project, the sooner you can show me a draft or a template or a prototype and get feedback from me before that feedback is attached to a grade that cannot be changed. So the readings for the next few weeks will be from the third and last textbook, which is Wikipedia at 20. And that textbook is available electronically. If you go to the syllabus, there is a section called textbooks where you will find the link, okay? This is the textbook, and there are two links that you can use to access the book. You can download all of it, or you can download just the chapters that will be assigned. Of course, there are more than 30 chapters and we'll just read a few. Okay, i probably add myself the links of the chapters we are reading in the week by week list of lectures and readings. And so that you can properly plan, think of the calendar, the key dates that we have in front of us, because today is April 4th. So, the digital project itself should be completed by May 9th. And of course, depending on the app, you will share the project with me following the instructions for that particular app. Okay? If your project, well, I'll talk about DocuWiki. If your project is on Notion, you will invite me. Not use a shareable link, but invite me. If your project is in Evernote, you need to share not the single pages you created, 
but the whole notebook with the project, where the pages of the project are situated. If it is in DocuWiki, you will be most certainly use uh, my own server, so you will just let me know that you want to use DocuWiki so that I can create a separate space where either just you and I have access, or if you want, uh, other people can view the content, not do anything else, but I need to set up a space for you to give privileges, editing rights just to you. The digital project is also connected to a presentation and later on this month, I will publish a series, of, a calendar of all the time slots that I will make available between May 2nd and May 13th so that you can present the project to me on Zoom. If you want to do it in person, uh, we can meet in my office on some days or you can record a presentation yourself. I would recommend that you use Zoom because Zoom would allow you to put on the screen your project because the presentation, whether you do it in front of me, in presence, in front of me on Zoom, or whether you video record your presentation, your presentation is basically a show and tell of your project, which describes and demonstrates quickly the contents. But it's mostly a presentation of the design of your project, the functions that are included with your project, the nice things that you can do with the prototype of your project. By May 2nd, if you opt to do it in one of the earlier days, your project may not be complete, right? You may want to add to it, add more pages, or add a few more features, but by the time of your presentation, whenever it is, you have to have enough material and enough features to demonstrate in front of me. And it should be a dynamic presentation, right? Where, where you click, where you show how you can do advanced searches, how you can filter out content. And if one a user, a potential user is interested just in one kind of content, the project that you've realized allows to quickly go jump to specific passages, sections, pages, where their content can be found. Keep in mind that the primary goal of your project is to build something that would be more than a regular website, right? Where one can scroll and read and find content on their own. It should be something that, it, that is structured in such a way and has such dynamic features that I can more efficiently, more quickly access information, more efficiently access possible patterns that I find in a cluster of pages, of all the pages that you have created, etc., etc. Which means also that the content has to be suitable for that purpose. And it's up to you to choose the content, but clearly between now and May, you can run your choice by me and say, uh, this is what I have in mind. Do you think it would be suitable? And as I said, at any moment in time, you can start sharing your project with me and get some feedback, both about the quality or whether there is enough material, etc. Of course, if you do it before the project is due, if your presentation is for May 9th, then you can also get some feedback from me that might allow you to revise your project, to expand it, to add something to it, to make it better. This uh, will not be possible if you uh, opt for a later date, but it's up to you to schedule it. As I said, I will publish a list of several time slots every day, every day between May 2nd and May 13th, I will have several hours with 30 minutes time slots, and you can find at any time a, an available, a free time slot, 
and reserve it by sending me an email. If later you need to reschedule, you can clearly do that. You just find another available time slot if you want to present in front of me. I think presenting in front of me would be ideal, but if you'd rather uh, video record, it's fine. As long as your recorded presentation is dynamic enough, you're presenting, you're showing your expertise on this app and the project you produced, reading would be uh, disastrous, right? Uh, wouldn't be a presentation if you are video recording and just reading from the screen, okay? And the presentation itself doesn't have to be very formal, right? With a formal introduction, a formal conclusion, it's a show and tell. So show me your project, show me what's interesting, what's exciting, and then the best conclusion would be a short reflection about the app itself. I've used this app long enough and I've made this uh, interesting complex project and I can tell you that I would have liked to find this feature. I would have liked this part of the process to be better, smoother. I found this difficult or I found uh, uh, this boring and cumbersome, etc. So your reflection at the end would be a nice way to conclude your presentation. If you want, some people have done it in the past. If you want, whatever your project is, independently of the uh, topic, you can also add one page where you write down your reflection. If you feel that your presentation, the part of the presentation devoted to your reflection is not enough and you have more to say that is relevant and appropriate, you may want to leave space for uh, a page that is not directly related to the topic and the focus of your project, but just a page or a note where you will list your reflections on the app and the construction of the project itself, okay? And of course, I'll be asking during the next few weeks, I'll be asking what progress you're making, what apps you've chosen, what topics you have in mind. I want to make sure you're making progress um, working on the project and I want to allow you to ask questions in class as well. Of course, you can also come to my office. This is the page where you completed the last digital assignment on DocuWiki. At this point, uh, since the deadline was Friday, I have changed your privileges, your rights for this page. From this point on, unless you were one, there were two people at this point who have an extension still in place, but otherwise at this point you can view the content of your page, but you cannot change it anymore. I will be reviewing these pages during the week and as I did for the assignment on Evernote, I will send you my comments and the grade via email. Okay. And these are the notes on chapters four and five, which I completed. As far as chapter seven and eight, uh, you don't need a systematic review uh, and posting of listing of key points from me. I'll, I'll just do it uh, orally. And this is where we were. We were talking about the telephone. The success of the telephone and how the telephone became the first broadcasting system and was used initially as a radio and even after radios were introduced in plenty of homes, businesses, administrative <coughs> offices, uh, the phones continue to be used also in that way, right? Because one of the threats that you find in these, pattern, in these chapters is the convergence of various technologies 
and also the overlapping because to this day including the devices that are available to us we haven't seen one device replace all the others right let's say the smartphone which can be used as a tv as a radio etc etc hasn't replaced the other devices what we see is convergence but we see overlap while multiple devices share the same factors. Telephone culture is a relevant part of the chapter in the book, the section on the telephone, because the introduction of this device changed the social culture of people who, in the United States, for example, were living in farms and other isolated areas, right? All of a sudden, you have a communication network that allows you to uh, um, not feel isolated anymore. It affected the practice of medicine, especially in those areas, because early on, the uh, associations of American doctors were very active in exploiting new technologies. The telephone, as well as, for example, the automobile. Doctors uh, were targeted by marketing campaigns uh, for, for the selling of automobiles and, and became users of automobiles in the name of efficiency. You can see more patients, right, every day, as opposed to moving around with horse and carriages. Again, keep in mind the broadcasting function of the telephone. The telephone was also used to report the news, to report especially information about uh, the pattern in uh, the stocks, stock exchange, and of course, it changed the social habits. At a time, at the end of the 19th century, or the first decades of the 20th century, when still a considerable number of women were uh, spending their lives as mothers and housewives, morning chats became part of their routines. And this remained the case for a long time. I myself, I was born in 1963, and I remember that my mother, every morning at around 9 a.m., would uh, receive a call or call herself her sister, even though they were not living very far from each other. So they were still in the same town, but every morning they would touch base with each other, exchange a few uh, ideas and it was this morning chat at around this time because at that point everyone else in the house had left and uh, women who were not working had been supporting the start of the day right helping people get ready uh, preparing breakfast etc ready for work or for school etc of course the issue of the content that travels over those networks came to the awareness of the users, right? Can you swear on telephone? Would you, should you be allowed to swear on a telephone? Which is not completely private, right? Because you, you still have switchboards. You still have people who can listen on your conversations. And of course, there is a concern and there is evidence that even criminals are using the telephone and relying on telephone calls for their activities. The next few sections are not as long as the others. I'll try to go through them quickly so that if there is enough time, we can have a conversation on the topics of chapters seven and eight. We could say that the radio was invented by Guglielmo Marconi, an Italian who moved uh, to London in the, 90, in the 1890s to pitch his invention to various uh, investors and who created a company there, the company that expanded the United States, uh, registered multiple patents. But the radio, like the telephone, is one of those inventions that happened in multiple places in slightly different forms. So Marconi himself is indebted to scientists and inventors that came before him. But at the same time, we find around that time other people 
who invented devices which were very similar. Okay, so keep that in mind, invention in quotation marks, because it's, we, we can agree on Marconi having invented this device, but we find perfect or almost perfect alternatives to Marconi's radio in other places, other laboratories, created by people who, in some instances, were not as quick in registering the patent. Okay, so he went to England, he created a company after he consulted with multiple investors there during those years, even though the radio took another 20 years or so to become a household appliance and something that was relevant in society in general. Initially, investors weren't ready to hear the pitch by Marconi, because what do you have to sell? if you have a radio, as opposed to the telegraph. Of course, they were uh, comparing the radio and the telegraph. The radio was the wireless telegraph, right? But if you have a wire, it means that you have stations that are issuing the signal. And you can direct where the signal is going, who's originating the signal, who's receiving the message at the end. So if you control this, then you have a service that you can sell, right? And you sell, for example, telegrams. And you sell telegrams by the word, by the character, and you make money this way. But if you have something going up, a message going up, out in the air, and anyone with a receiver can pick up that message, how can you charge for it? How can you prevent people who are not paying from using that service? So invest investors were kind of cold, had, had a cold ear, uh, they, they saw being so free, free of an infrastructure as a disadvantage because without the infrastructure, how do you control the contents that you're supposed to sell? Same for the military. Yes, it's great. The radio can reach a unit. Uh, it doesn't matter where that unit is moving, but anyone can listen on, on the messages, right? And the technology did not allow for encryption for a very long time. Yes, you can develop a code whereby you, you code the text itself, right? Uh, you encode some of the information, but uh, that as well is time consuming and not entirely foolproof. Military codes have been used since the 16th century, but decoding was not impossible. Broadcasting everywhere was seen as a waste of energy, right? Why would I need to reach out in every place, including places where there is no receiver? Because those ra radio waves go everywhere. We've discussed the issue of control. Now, in spite of this, there were plenty of people who got excited, got enthused, by the device. And this is one of the cases where amateurs played a big role. They created, early on in the late 1890s and early 1900s, clubs with uh, radio stations that were trying to broadcast uh, to other uh, groups of amateurs and trying to perfect the technology. These amateurs would modify the radios themselves. For example, they would modify or build their own crystals to operate on certain wavelengths. And uh, their name uh, that was established early on and still popular was ham, from both the sound of the first syllable of the word amateur, and also a term that was used ironically for amateur actors who were not very good. And um, even though the 1912 Radio Act limited what amateurs could do, what these wireless clubs could do, for example, which wavelengths they could operate on, the phenomenon uh, grew to the point that even today, in spite of the digital revolution, you find three million people in the United States that have radios and communicate to each other at this point, the game is especially being able to send your uh, radio signal 
to the other side of the world, for example, to Argentina or to Eastern Europe, etc. Okay. Initially, both investors and even some of the creators did not think that the radio would extend to a large base of consumers. They thought it would be uh, the use would be limited to some administrative agencies, some private companies, the military, etc. Progress was slow but constant. By 1899, the radios uh, made by Marconi were powerful enough to send messages from England to France across the channel. And there you start seeing some clear advantage, right? Because having the channel in between England and France means that either whatever information you have has to be put on a ship uh, to be transported materially, or you need uh, underwater uh, telegraph cables which are expensive to place and expensive to maintain. By the time World War I came, radio was used more and more, but even there it grew, the use of radios grew throughout the world. The war, uh, uh, which started in 1914, ended in 1918. It wasn't until 1918 that the radio was uh, relevant on the battlefield to the point where you have radio devices that can be installed on armored vehicles uh, and um, convey information. I'm, I'm talking about light armored vehicle which can, can convey information about reconnaissance missions, meaning you, you send an armored vehicle with uh, uh, tires, uh, with wheels, uh, and, and they can communicate where the enemy is if the other slower units of infantry can advance in a certain direction, etc., and, and then the radio becomes a strategic uh, device um, that is more powerful. After the war, as you can expect, as, as a downfall also of the evolution of the device during the war, after uh, the war, especially in the United States, the device became very popular. But it's important to understand that in order of importance, during the 1920s, during this period of development of the technology and popularization of the technology, in terms of content, the idea that music came first was the most important content for this technology, followed by news, and then followed also by education, the idea of lectures, right? Which we found even in popular literature or on the lecture circuit in 19th century, the, this idea that you can self-educate, you can improve yourself through self-education by listening to lectures or by going in presence to listen to a lecture. And the idea of advertisement came later during the 1920s, was not the first thing that came to mind. And, and there was also a conflict uh, they saw a contrast between these two missions. Really, it should be an educational device. Uh, no time, no energy should be wasted um, with something as trivial as advertisement, right? That was seen as a trivialization of, of the technology itself. By 1922, in the US, there were more than 500 TV station, uh, radio stations with a license. A license was necessary at the, this point, based on the Radio Act of 1912. And soon enough, during this decade, it became a household appliance, something that you would find in a lot of homes. Not all of them, but those devices were kind of expensive initially. So 1922, only 100,000 radios were sold. But the next year, five times as many by 1925, there were 5.5 <coughs> million radios in use in the US. And by the, the late 1920s, early 30s, the radio was instrumental in political campaigns. For example, in the uh, campaign that uh, brought uh, the, to the election, the re-election of uh, Roosevelt in 19 1932, for example. And Roosevelt himself would address the population regularly on the radio, and that 
gave him influence, political influence, and uh, became part of his success. You have the creation of networks of radios, right? These radio come together to share content. NBC, CBS are created in 1926 and 27. B is the key for the acronym of these companies, National Broadcasting Company, the broadcasting system, because those companies were created initially as radio companies and later became TV companies. In terms of the power of these devices, by 19, 1901, a signal can travel for 2,000 miles. The space that separates Cornwall in southeast England to Newfoundland, uh, which is west, uh, a big island west of Canada. In 1906, the idea of SOS signal from ship in distress was standardized and, of course, radios were installed on ships for this purpose and when in 1912 the Titanic sank, the radio signal went out, the SOS signal went out via radio and, and the signal itself was received on a radio station in Long Island. Among the technical improvements, you don't have to know all the details, but keep in mind that a lot of work was done on valves installed in radios to improve the quality of the signal and also to amplify the power of that signal. We said that music was the primary content for radios. And this music could be live music, someone playing in front of a microphone and their music being broadcasted with radio waves. But a lot of that music early on came from records, from discs played by a gramophone. And this was an idea that was developed at the end, an invention that was developed at the end of the 19th century. Uh, the view, the vision that drove the creation of this was we have photographs, and there is a section where there are a few notes about the invention of the photographs which came in the 19, in the 18, started in the 1810 and 20s. We have photographs, can we have, can we create an acoustic reproduction that is similar to a photograph? That is to say, the same way that we can capture a moment in time with an image, can we capture something that we hear that is being said or a sound in a way that we can preserve it and reproduce it? That was the idea. Edison worked a lot on this. He had, he pursued a lot of projects, but, but was, and, and of course did not work directly on, on many of them, but he was particularly attached uh, to this. And he created a recording machine that he called a phonograph that was based on wax cylinders. And sometimes if you go to an uh, antique market, sometimes you still find these cylinders with music. The material is wax and um, the uh, cylinder is surrounded by tin foil and there is a needle that carves a profile in the cylinder while the cylinder rotates, and once you produce a recording that way, it can also be uh, played back. The idea in terms of function, the, pro the, the primary function, the priority was seen as being able to dictate a letter, being able to record a letter that a secretary would later type. This is how it was marketed. It was also uh, applied to the idea that in order to be successful as a seller, to operate in marketing, you need to perfect your language. And part of the language is elocution, that is to say, the rhythm, the cadence of your voice, the quality of your voice, of course, the pronunciation, but all of those things come together in the voice as something material, physical, three-dimensional. And you need to work on that in order to be influence, uh, influential uh, with your customers 
as a, as a professional, as someone who's selling things, uh, as someone is marketing things. So again, the idea is still training, education. And these are the priorities, right? Notice that music, in this case, comes last in terms of their view of the device and its function. Even before music, the idea that you can create an archive, a historical archive where sound is preserved, for example, the voice of a president, the voice of a hero, the voice of an eyewitness to history. So before this person dies and a wealth of information goes away with the disappearance of this individual who may be the representative of a community, of a language, of a culture, you can have a recording made to preserve content and everything else on this cylinder. Edison was very excited about this invention, but there were other people who moved more quickly after he introduced the phonograph. So he missed the boat on the creation of discs instead of cylinders, discs made with different material, initially even metal. And since phonograph had been patented as it was a trademarked uh, name, uh, patented by Edison, could not be used for this variation on the same thing, they came up with the word gramophone, okay? And the, the Victor company is the company that uh, really created a market for the selling of music, that understood how this uh, device could be used to uh, produce and sell music. And so you have Enrico Caruso, who was an opera singer from Italy, very famous people would uh, pay to see him, uh, to hear him sing in uh, New York theaters or theaters around the world. He <coughs> was engaged in the production of successful records. He was the first one to uh, sell more than a million copies of a single record in 1904. And by the end of his life, he had made $2 million just off of his record production, which was a huge amount at that point, right? Small house in the United States in the early 1900s could be had for less than $10,000, just to give you an idea. And that's within this period, and especially thanks to the company called Victor, you have the introduction of the common categories that you see now, the distinction between classical music and popular music, which is abbreviated from the beginning as pop music, the creation of jazz as uh, a, a more creative um, category. And initially, musicians and performers didn't, weren't really protected by copyrights and they were paid often very little, unless they were a celebrity like Caruso. And he could be very demanding. He was a good entrepreneur. He knew what his value might be, but otherwise a lot of musicians and performers during the first decades of the 20th century were terribly exploited and then little by little copyright laws were introduced to guarantee they got a profit from their work. Photography has a long history because the first form is what was called a camera obscura and this was a device, was basically a box with a pinhole, and under it, the correct lighting condition, the image from outside, an image could be projected, the light from an image behind this machine could be projected onto a surface. And we know now, books were written only in the last 30 years about this, but we know now that some of the artists of the 15th and 16th century, uh, the period where the perspective was introduced in the arts and realism then in the 1500s became a big thing. Think, for example, of Caravaggio, master of realism. A lot of those artists were using the camera obscura to have 
a more realistic uh, representation of their subject. So they would project an image onto the, um, a, a wall or onto a painting and then proceed with their work. So that was the first element, the first step in the direction of photography. The issue, what needed to be addressed and resolved was how to print that image using chemical elements. And that this was possible, the knowledge related to the possibility of printing the uh, image produced by light emerged in, at the very beginning of the 19th century. So a geography was a very crude way to print an image without much contrast, very soft image. However, by the 1830s, a Frenchman by the name of Daguerre invented the daguerreotype, uh, which is the form, the first photograph. The primary limitation was that you needed more than a minute, initially uh, about three minutes, to uh, take an image, and therefore you, you had to have your, your subject be perfectly still or take a picture of something uh, that is not uh, animated, uh, but progress was made throughout the century. In the second part of the century, the uh, um, emphasis was on the new features that could be added to photography. Photography became popular. Everyone, even people without great means, wanted to have a series of photographs shot during their lives or during special occasions, such as a marriage, etc. Uh, but later on, the emphasis was on color pictures, which were made initially just by painting on the pictures. And stereography was very fashionable at the turn of the century between the 19th and the 20th century, and then it fell out of fashion. The idea that you take two pictures to give a three, that you watch through a stereograph to have a 3D uh, image. And that color photo, proper color photography was developed. The most important advancement is the creation of the Kodak camera by George Eastman, and of course Kodak had a big factory upstate near Rochester, which uh, then uh, was, was uh, first the, the workforce was reduced and then the factory uh, closed down their work on, on film uh, when digital devices were introduced. But what made the Kodak popular was that it was portable and that everything other than clicking a button, everything would be taken care by a network. That is to say, you uh, click a button, take a picture, bring the film to a lab, and just uh, come by to, to get your printed pictures. So thanks to the Kodak, tourists would arm themselves with pictures, etc. And once you get the invention of, the, uh, of photography, then from photography, to motion pictures, uh, you, you can clearly see how the evolution uh, took place. And even for this, yes, the Lumiere brothers from Lyon, France, uh, were the first uh, to uh, sh have a cinematograph to show uh, a series of films in Paris, but many others before them had been able to produce very short films. Even their first uh, uh, show was a series of 30 to 50 second films, 10 of them shown to a small audience. Of course, it's not just about the technology. The main ideas of what a film should be about, what is the style of a film, how you create a film to uh, capture the attention of an audience, came by other people who were also worked on the technical side, such as the French Georges Méliès. And Georges Méliès started by mixing theater and film. He would have shows that took place on the stage, so some scenes in a story would be acted by the actors on the stage, 
And then from those scenes, you would go to watching a film of a few minutes and then have a conclusion on stage as well. So you had a hybrid medium, including both live performance and films. Then he moved, of course, uh, one of his um, films hybrid uh, shows, which incorporated an automobile, which was the story of a raid from Paris to Monte Carlo, uh, was so successful that in order to sell it all over the world, he made a full film of it. He added special effects and worked a lot on special effects. And many is instrumental in the development of films because he was making sometimes a film per week. But every time he tried something different. And every time he made it more complicated. To the point where, yes, he could shoot a film in a week, but then production might take several weeks or months because he also wanted to have color films. But at that point, he could only do it by manually coloring the frames. You can imagine the amount of labor. In fact, by the 1920s, he went bankrupt because he was trying to do things that were too complicated, too expensive. And he was so obsessed with cinema that he would spend more than the producers made available to him. He had to sell the rights to all his films, ended his life in a nursing home. And even before that, for a period of years, he was working in a kiosk selling candy and newspapers. Hollywood, of course, on this side of the Atlantic in the early 19th, 20th century became the mecca of cinema for a very simple reason, right? What is the reason why uh, everybody went to California to shoot a movie? You people, any ideas? Nice Sorry? Nice weather, yeah. More sunny days than in other places, right? And more days that you can easily shoot outside because especially in the beginning, you need a lot of natural light. And we tend to think as, uh, of silent film as a limited version of a film. In fact, in many ways, it was more powerful because silent films produced on either side of the Atlantic could be sold as a global product. You just had to change the text in, in the few uh, frames that, you, uh, that were interspersed with the scenes, but you had a product that anyone could watch and appreciate. Once you add sound, it becomes much more difficult to have a global market. And of course, you, you know the rest, but Keep in mind, we're not interested in the technical details other than a few that I pointed out. We're interested in the culture of these technologies. So there is a lot in the book, in the textbook, that you can go through very quickly or even skip. Same with TV, I haven't added much about this. It was developed primarily in Great Britain in the 1930s, but it wasn't until the 1950s that it becomes a household appliance and you have the TV industry developing. Hillary. It's like the soap opera is like from radio and then they like adapt it yes. to television. Of course, there are a lot of formats that get transported and transformed from radio to TV. Radios had series where stories uh, um, had various installments and those stories were of course usually read or interpreted live then recorded to be broadcasted again, and the way you keep the attention of the viewers. Uh, for example, by creating tension at the end of an episode, by introducing some turn or some critical moment in the story at the end of an episode so that people will want to tune in and listen to the continuation to know how it ends those elements were first developed in the radio industry and then uh, incorporated in TV series during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and uh, even to this day in some instances. Yeah, right? Keep in mind that TV is not exactly a global network at the beginning. 
it is now because TV is uh, the content on TV is digitized, right? But initially there were different systems to encode the image in a TV set. And therefore an American product could not be sold on the European market because they used different uh, technologies. And this uh, was true of the black and white TV, but it continued with the color TV. So uh, there were Asian markets because they used a different standard in Japan, etc. So it is a global product, but globalization requires a process of adaptation to technical standards and then there is also the issue of localizing the cultural content of the TV. So there is a limit to what you can sell where based on the culture of the story. The book includes a final chapter, a final section in chapter five about the, the physical networks of transportation and what changes were brought by the introduction of the bicycle, another 19th century invention. Don't believe for a moment that Leonardo da Vinci invented the bicycle. The bicycle, the crude, but it's not so crude, that's the issue. The not so crude bicycle you find in a da Vinci manuscript was probably introduced there by a da Vinci scholar, an Italian scholar. Um, a lot of uh, professors of technology and society uh, believe that, uh, uh, and, and I also uh, do. The, the, the scholar opened two pages that were glued to one another in a manuscript, found there probably two circles next to each other because one thing that Leonardo uh, had a lot of drawing in his notebooks of was cogwheels of different kinds. And based on those two circles, the Italian scholar probably added the uh, bicycle. What is problematic about that draft, the alleged draft of a bicycle by Leonardo, is the very fact that you find a complete bicycle. It's supposed to be the first bicycle, but it's complete. You find pedals, you find a chain, you find the handlebar, everything is already there. And there are no other examples, nothing, not a note, not another view anywhere else in Leonardo, uh, Leonardo's notebooks. So scrap that. Just a prank by, by a scholar who then died in the 1990s. Um, and the real bicycles were introduced at the beginning of the 19th century without pedals and made of wood. And then the bone shakers were created and different kinds of bicycles. And by the end of the century, by the 1880s, the bicycle was pretty much perfected as an invention. What's interesting about the bicycle is that people might have seen it as a variation on the theme of traveling on a horse. When in fact, it was perceived as a different kind of symbiosis. It's not man plus machine. The man is one with the bicycle and the bicycle, it's not about transportation is about giving the human being speed without the need for a network such as in the case, a network of infrastructure such as in the case of ships and trains. The same happens with automobiles. Uh, the only names you have to keep in mind are uh, this German married couple, Carl and Bertha Benz. Uh, Carl Benz worked and patented an automobile in 1886, but it was Bertha who, through her family, provided funds for this invention to be developed and followed the development of the invention. And she had such an active role that in 1888, when the first uh, tricycle by Carl Benz had only been tested on the factory ground, in 1888, Bertha took the car on a 60 plus miles trip which is the first long distance trip by an automobile. When she went to visit some relatives, but she knew, she, she, she was skilled enough, she knew that this was a real life test. And during this test, she had to overcome technical problems, she had to fix the linings of the brakes herself. Of course, she ran out of pet petrol, and where did she go? Because there weren't any gas stations. So last questions before you leave.
Where did she go? Where did Bertha Benz go to refuel her car since it was the first time a car was on the road and there were no gas stations? Like a general store? Close enough, to a pharmacy, yeah. Because uh, different, both uh, uh, hardware stores and pharmacies would sell alcohol. And the first cars used a very purified form of benzene that was very close to alcohol. So she could refuel that way. And alcohol could be used uh, as well as benzene could be used also, was used uh, in households as to, to remove stains, right? Or to, as a, as a thinning agent for, for paint. Okay, make sure you return the attendance sheet. I'll be in my office, I'll go to my office now, I'll be there until 1 p.m. If you need anything, any help, let me know.